you plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and sit up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explain why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fagera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fagaret Esaoya is actually named after Fagarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate you decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanats, said that the circles were definitely not Kanats. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity and Kanats were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, 
pick up cars, food, equipment, also that the mystery of the Sahara Circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock, without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint, so faint you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar, metal wires, thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh Uh-oh, it looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, Better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara Circles. You bring photos in the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So, what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara Circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect 
which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity, more specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. 
the Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding and weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. There's a ship drifting somewhere in the ocean without a crew. The last time someone saw it was over 50 years ago. Its story reminds of that of the Flying Dutchman, a ship that's bound to sail forever and bring disaster to whoever sees it at sea. At least, the legend says so. Unlike the Flying Dutchman, the SS Bay Chimo was definitely real and built for a German company in Hamburg and began as an ordinary cargo ship. It was trading supplies between Hamburg and Sweden in the Baltic Sea starting from 1914. It had a strong steam engine and a hull made of steel. A few years later, it became British property. Then, in the 1920s, a Canadian company purchased it for around $18,000, a huge amount of money back then. The new owner, the Hudson's Bay Company, was actively using the ship for several years. They would often send it on voyages from its home port in Scotland to Siberia, Alaska, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. It also passed through the Panama Canal and even the Suez Canal, with fur pelts for sale on board. Sometimes it would also transport passengers. It had completed nine successful voyages before this strip of good luck came to an end. Starting from the 1930s, SS Beichimo would have trouble with ice and storms. When it first got trapped in ice in October of 1931, some of the crew managed to escape to Alaska. 15 of 22 sailors decided to stay with their vessel and try to save it. They had furs and other valuable cargo worth around $58,000 aboard. The company sent them supplies to survive the winter. They set camp near the ship out of the hatches, tarpaulins, and other materials, and offloaded the cargo. At the end of November, a blizzard rushed through the area and it seemed like it had taken the ship with it. The ice platform had survived, but the ship broke free. Some of the crew members were sure it had sunk. But soon after, they heard from one of the locals who had spotted their ship around 45 miles away from their camp. The crew moved on with their lives, and the ship started its journey as a runaway vessel. People would spot SS Bay Chimo once a year or so, all the way until 1965. It was mostly spotted off the coast of Alaska. A man going to Nome with his sled dog, along with prospectors, explorers, and treasure hunters, all claimed to have seen SS Bay Chimo. Someone tried to board it and take it to port but ended up stranded on it for days because of horrible weather. 
Others got luckier and managed to take a whale boat, some furniture, and other valuables from the vessel. Those who got close to the ship saw that it was damaged and missing the propeller. Still, it stayed afloat without a crew for at least 38 years and became the longest sailing ghost ship in history. In 2006, the Alaskan authorities started a project to solve the mystery of this ghost ship of the Arctic and finally find SS Bechimo, either still above or below the water. So far, the project has not been a success. SS Bechimo remains one of the estimated 4,000 ships that have disappeared off Alaskan shores. If the legend of the 17th century isn't lying, this ghost ship could be sailing somewhere along the Flying Dutchman. It belonged to the Dutch East India Company. Its captain managed to do the impossible for that time and sailed from Holland to Indonesia in only three months. They said he was flying over the sea, and some evil tongues explained that he had made a deal with evil forces to achieve that. Once the ship was sailing back home, its captain and crew disappeared without a trace. There are many versions of what happened to it. One of the first ones said it had tried to enter port at the Cape of Good Hope, got in a terrible storm, and sank as there was no captain to save it. Another legend says the captain had refused to obey the skies to let the ship sink during the storm. A scary life form then struck the boat and the crew, and it was condemned to forever wander without rest. Many sailors claim to have spotted the wandering Dutchman. The Duke of York, who was to become King of England, mentioned having seen it in Australian waters. Right after spotting the ship, the man who saw it first fell from the top of the mast and didn't survive. There were more encounters with this legendary ship up to the middle of the 20th century. Ships would nearly collide with it as the Flying Dutchman jumped out of the blue. Scientists have a more logical explanation for this mystery. Fata Morgana, not to be confused with Akuna Matata. Now, when you're out at sea on a hot day and the air is all wavy, it feels like when you look at the road on a scorching summer day. That's because of something called atmospheric refraction. When light passes through different layers of air with different temperatures and densities, it bends and twists. Sometimes, under certain conditions, this bending of light can create really bizarre optical illusions over the ocean like sightings of the Flying Dutchman. The Fata Morgana phenomenon can make distant objects appear distorted, stretched, or even lifted above the horizon. So, you can see a ship far away, but because of the way the light is bending, it will look like it's floating above the water or even disappearing and reappearing. A Fata Morgana is most commonly seen in polar regions, especially over large sheets of ice that have a uniform low temperature. But you can see it anywhere, even in deserts and over lakes on hot days. The first stories about ghost ships go all the way back to ancient Greek and Roman mythology. One of the most famous ghost ships in history is the Mary Celeste. This brigantine was traveling from New York City to Genoa and was fully stocked with provisions, but missing a crew when it was discovered in the Atlantic Ocean in 1872. The crew's personal belongings were also there, completely undisturbed. The final entry in your log was made 10 days earlier. We still don't know what happened to its crew, and the ship has inspired many spooky stories and legends. The Lady Lovabond was another legendary schooner that is believed to have been wrecked off the coast of Kent in the middle of the 18th century. The story tells that the ship's captain, Simon Reed, had just got married and took his bride on board for a celebratory cruise, despite the superstition that it could bring bad luck. They were on their way to Portugal when the first mate, who was also in love with the captain's new wife, went mad because of jealousy, attacked another crew member, and then took over the wheel and steered the ship straight into the dreaded Goodwin Sands. No one aboard survived, and the schooner is said to reappear as a ghost vessel every 50 years. In present times, many vessels become abandoned and turned into ghost ships intentionally. There are thousands of them floating in U.S. rivers, lakes, channels, and coastal waters. Some people lose their boats in storms and other extreme weather. Others have to abandon their boats because maintaining them can cost 10% of the boat's price. Plus, docking a vessel can add up to several thousand dollars every year. 
Most boats have been made of fiberglass, so an owner can't just recycle them as scrap metal. So, once they want to get rid of it, they often tie it to a dock and sneak away, or leave it floating far away from the shore, or just try to sink it. When ghost ships sink in shallow waters, they can cause damage to coral reefs, mangroves, marshlands, oyster habitats, and wetlands. Plus, they can collide with unsuspecting regular ships and cause real trouble. So, don't do that. Enough said. We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes – that's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization. Although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry, 
In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact type. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. Under the burning sun, among the sand dunes, somewhere in the Sahara Desert, you're walking in search of an ancient treasure. Finally, you find a strange rock in the sand. It's big, looks like a large piece of black coal or rock, but something shiny on its surface makes the rock unusual. This unique find is the oldest thing that has ever been discovered on our planet. This rock was born long before Earth appeared in outer space. 
The unusual meteorite was found in 2020 in a remote area of the Sahara Desert. Scientists have analyzed the isotopes of magnesium and aluminum on the stone's surface and found that its age is about 4.5 billion years. At the moment, this is the oldest sample of magma from space in history. It belongs to a small protoplanet that didn't have time to form completely. It happened a very long time ago when our solar system was forming. Many huge asteroids were floating in space. Some of them were formed into huge celestial bodies, which later became planets. The big rocky planets were absorbing the smaller ones. The rock was part of a little protoplanet that just began its formation, but another huge asteroid destroyed it. The planet shattered into billions of pieces. Some of them became part of other planets. Some flew outside the solar system. And one piece that had been wandering in space until our Earth was formed. After that, it hit the planet's atmosphere and fell into the territory now known as the Sahara Desert. The rock was discovered in 2020, but the erosion of extraterrestrial rocks shows that it could have fallen much earlier. This ancient thing weighing around 70 pounds has several pieces of different meteorites inside. In simple words, it's a volcanic rock consisting of lava. It has cooled, solidified, and crystallized. That's why you notice the glitter. Scientists hope that further study of the rock will help to learn more about our solar system foundation. The biggest asteroid discovered in the U.S. is the Willamette. Its size is 84 square feet, and its weight is more than 15 tons. This is half the weight of a bus. Several people can fit on the surface of this outer space object. But the coolest thing is that it's not a rock like most meteorites that were found. Willamette is made of nickel and iron. This massive piece of metal was discovered in 1906. Now, the huge rock is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. The largest meteorite ever found is Hoba. It's located in Namibia, and people have never changed its position because it's too heavy. The weight of Hoba is 60 tons. It's heavier than a tank. The next space-related event occurred on February 28th in southwest England. On this day, a huge flash lit up the sky. Then there was a loud crash. Several residents opened the doors of their houses and noticed a black sooty spot on the lawn. They immediately guessed what had happened and reported the discovery to the British Meteorite Observation Network. If you ever find a meteorite, report it to some geological research or space center as soon as possible. The longer a space rock lies on the ground, the faster it loses its value. Rain, dust, snow, wind, scorching sun, all these factors damage the surface of the meteorite. It makes it difficult to study the celestial object. The meteorite found in England looks like coal, but it's way softer and more fragile. It most likely used to contain frozen water. The rock is part of a huge asteroid that plowed through outer space when our solar system hadn't fully formed yet. They found a unique combination of minerals inside the rock. It can help scientists learn more about the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. Now we're heading to Germany, to the small town of Nördlingen. A huge ancient meteorite's hidden here. It's very difficult to notice it unless you know the secret of this town. You're walking along the cozy little streets and looking at the buildings with beautiful architecture. You spend the whole day there and don't find anything that reminds you of a meteorite. To solve the mystery, you need to get out of town. So you climb a high hill and see that the city is located inside a pit. For a long time, locals were sure the house was located in the crater of an extinct volcano. If you look at the houses from a certain angle, you may notice an unusual shining coming from them. In the middle of the 20th century, a group of geologists came here and immediately declared that the crater doesn't look like a volcanic one. The town was built on a huge crater left by a meteorite. The huge celestial body fell here about 15 million years ago. It was so hot that the carbon bubbles inside instantly turned into small diamonds. When people were building this city, they didn't know they were using expensive stones, since the diamonds were hardly visible. The locals never attached importance to the fact that the city walls shine unusually in the sun. Now they believe this place was built from diamonds that had fallen from the sky. Our next stop is in the UK again. This time, the rocks are of an earthly origin. The famous Stonehenge. People place circles of rocks here in a certain order. 
Everyone knows about this archaeological monument, but no one knows the reason for its creation for certain. Another construction built out of mysterious rocks was discovered just 2 miles away. It's called Superhenge. It's bigger, heavier, and takes up more space. Each plate here is 15 feet, which is about the height of two floors. Once, the stone stood vertically and formed a huge semicircle. But someone pushed the stones over about 4,500 years ago. It was a college prank. No, not really. That's why they couldn't be detected for a long time. Scientists still can't solve the mystery of Superhenge, but they believe the standing vertical stones were part of some huge monument. Some other amazing rocks are located in the south of Costa Rica. There are big ones the size of a human, and there are smaller ones the size of bowling balls. And they all have a perfectly round shape. These giant rocky spheres were created by people. It must have taken years of polishing using stone tools to get the perfect round shape. These balls are incredibly heavy, but can easily roll like a basketball. All the rocks are of a different age. Some of them were created about 2,500 years ago. Most of them are made of molten volcanic magma. Until now, scientists don't know for what purpose these stones were used. They were found in different parts of Costa Rica, near big cities. It's possible that ancient civilizations installed them specifically to show the greatness of local kings. Also, many experts believe the rocks were used as a tool for studying astronomy. The people who knew their purpose of the rocks had disappeared, and the history of the stones was lost along with them. Let's finish our journey with the coolest archaeological find. You're walking through the desert of Peru and climbing a low hill. You look down and notice the surface of the hill is covered with strange lines. You walk far away and see a huge cat on the hill. Such a drawing is called a geoglyph. Its length is around 120 feet, which is about half the size of a Boeing commercial jet. Archaeologists discovered the giant cat in 2020 and found out that it had been created somewhere between 200 and 100 BCE. This huge drawing is part of a mysterious group of different pictures. In addition to the cat, there are other animals, plants, and fantastic figures. All of them were found in the desert of Peru. The kitten was found by chance. Archaeologists didn't see it at first because natural erosion on the hillside had almost erased the silhouette. So the Sahara Desert is so big that it covers 8% of the world's territory. It's bigger than the USA or China. Surprisingly, the Sahara is not the largest desert in the world. It is the third largest, behind Antarctica and the Arctic. But it is definitely the hottest one. Temperatures there reach 136 degrees Fahrenheit. This place has some of the most incredible sand dunes you've ever seen, towering up to 1,476 feet. But here's the kicker. There's a real risk that these dunes might continue to spread until they cover the entire world. Surprisingly, the influence of the Sahara Desert extends far beyond its borders. Its dust, carried by powerful winds, makes its way to the UK and across the European continent, particularly in winter. This dust, settling on the ground where it rains, is a familiar sight to those in the UK, often leaving a red residue on cars. This connection between the Sahara, England, and Europe serves as a stark reminder of the global reach of environmental phenomena. You might think this is not a big deal, but it could turn Europe into a desert, leaving its soil infertile and Europeans with no food. Soil is a fundamental aspect of human existence, just as crucial as clean water and air. Without it, we're left with nothing but a bleak and barren landscape. The Sahara Desert has already made its jump across the Mediterranean Sea, which is concerning and could change the landscape forever. One-fifth of Spain has already turned into a desert. The next victim is Italy, which also faces the problem of desertification. In fact, almost all European countries have the same issue. According to an expert, the land that has not changed for nearly 2,000 years will become mostly rock, and people living on this land will be gone. 60% of the soil in Moldova is gone, and the problem has expanded beyond the Black Sea. It has reached China and Mongolia, thousands of miles away from the Sahara Desert. 
All of this causes losses of $4 billion a year. The threat is so significant that even the UN has gathered the necessary resources to solve the problem as soon as possible. Italy is sending help to Africa to stop the Sahara Desert from expanding. If this process does not stop in the next 10 years, millions will be forced to leave their homes. The Sahara Desert is growing for approximately 30 miles per decade. You do the math and see how long it will take to cover Europe. Since 1920, the Sahara has expanded by around 10%. But not all hope is lost because more than 172 countries have joined to put a stop to the desertification of the world. The World Food Program is a project that aims to help bring back green land that was once present in the Sahara. When they told people who called the Sahara home what they were about to do, the latter basically laughed in their faces and said it was impossible. But when you have a specific goal in mind, the impossible becomes possible. If we traveled back around 5,000 years into the past, we would see a beautiful forest with lush green trees and grass. Africa's climate has been changing for 21,000 years, from fantastic greenery to uninhabitable deserts. This has to do with Earth's rotation and the monsoons that bring water to this dry continent. But with the help of scientists and some clever tricks, we can bring the greenery back and stop the Sahara in its tracks. The Senegal River serves as a border between the Sahara Desert, Senegal City, and Mauritania. When you look at this area from space, you'll see how the desert is expanding to Senegal because the vegetation along the riverbank is almost non-existent. Forests can serve as a barrier, stopping the sand from getting blown away and the desert from expanding. An effort to create a great green wall is being made, and how they do it is actually quite impressive. Nothing has been growing in the currently restored area for more than 40 years, making locals find other places to call home. People were thrilled when they saw that the land could be restored. They're very committed and learn to work with the soil and grow food. At the same moment, more than 30,000 hectares have been restored and transformed into lush greenery. The Sahel region is the starting point of desertification, and it is crucial to establish a green wall in that area first. To make this wall is not rocket science, since it only takes a few simple steps. The ground there is baked by the sun and as hard as a block of concrete. If you've ever poured water on concrete, you know that it just flows away. It doesn't stay in one place. So they had to create water-retaining half-moons that would hold the water and make it available to plants. When you learn about how these half-moons work, you might say, how did they not think of that sooner? Actually, this technique is ancient and it was once implemented in Sahel, but it was lost over time. When the rain falls, the water is collected into the half-moons that are positioned a bit lower than the ground below contour lines. There is also a kind of bank at the end of the shape that prevents water from overflowing. And in the middle, there are plants that are happy because they have plenty of water to thrive. Also, it's essential to grow native plants that are kind of used to harsh conditions, like sorghum and millet. These plants have been surviving there for thousands of years and produce a good amount of biomass, which means the land can be rehabilitated faster and people will have food sooner. The water that will enter the half-moons won't be lost. It will penetrate the ground and top off underground waters. This will ensure the ground that H2O will never run out and that future generations will have usable aqua. This brilliant planting technique is not limited to half-moons. People also create lines and plant various vegetables, such as tomatoes. Next, there are places only for trees, like lemons or oranges. After a long, hot day, nothing is better than a freshly made cold lemonade. The trees will also protect the soil, and with some luck, there will be a new forest in the Sahara Desert. The goal is to copy the forest dynamic. Start with small plants and gradually expand to bigger plants that are more useful than the tiny ones. They are aiming to plant more than 10,000 trees. Right now, many people are leaving the Sahara after the rainy season, going to cities or leaving Africa altogether. 
At this time of year, villages are like ghost towns. Only animals can be found there. Most people are gone. I mean, who would blame them? Nobody wants to live in the sand where nothing grows. Luckily, with all this new, old technology being developed, many people are slowly but surely returning to their land and starting to work in agriculture. The best thing is that there are no brutal winters, so plants grow 12 months a year, and people can always have food. People are becoming more social because now everybody stays in their villages and doesn't travel much. If this project works out, Africa will be saved and the world won't turn into a giant desert. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles. And they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the Jumping Choya, or Teddy Bear Choya. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So, yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators but its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. 
Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still. There's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail, with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. As an experienced sailor and the first man to ever sail non-stop on his own around North and South America, Matt Rutherford has seen a lot during his voyages. But what he saw in 2013 while sailing through the waters of the Atlantic with his colleague surely stands out. Some 800 miles off the coast of Bermuda, not far away from the famous Bermuda Triangle, they noticed a boat that seemed to be moving by itself. The sails weren't up and the motor wasn't running. 
the sailors decided to check if there was someone who needed their help aboard, so they moved closer to the mysterious ship. Once they got there, things only got weirder as they realized there wasn't a living soul aboard. Rutherford started filming to document their discovery. The boat looked so awfully abandoned that they expected to find some pretty scary things in there. But it didn't stop Rutherford from searching the vessel. The boat, which turned out to be named Wolfhound, looked like an upscale one, probably costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was pretty weird to find it floating by itself in the middle of the ocean. It seemed like whoever abandoned it was leaving in a rush. There were clothes and other personal belongings all over the main cabin. Some parts of the ceiling had fallen and some drawers had popped open. The brave sailors decided to tow the ghost ship back to Bermuda. It wasn't easy because Wolfhound was bigger and heavier than their boat. After days at sea, the crew was running low on fuel and asked a passing freighter to stop and give them some gas. They kept pulling Wolfhound until the tow line got wrapped around the rudder and they realized they could get stranded in the Bermuda Triangle. So they had to abandon the ship. What really happened and how Wolfhound ended up in the middle of the ocean will probably remain a mystery. Rumor has it that it belonged to a member of the Royal Irish Yacht Club. The ship was going on its first voyage from Connecticut to Bermuda and then Antigua. It got in a terrible storm around 400 miles away from Delaware. The winds were so strong that the yacht suffered two knockdowns. A Greek cargo ship rescued the crew. They left the ship with an emergency beacon on. The rescued crew members shared that they saw the ship sink which only adds more questions to the story. How did it get back to the surface? Does the Bermuda Triangle have anything to do with that? Christopher Columbus himself reported some unusual compass activity going on in this mysterious area while he was on his way to the New World. Despite the stories of more than 50 ships and 20 planes disappearing in the area, it remains one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. It could make sense because the busier the area, the more accidents happen there. But then again, it's not the number of disappearances that makes the place so mysterious. It's the lack of explanation and wreckage lost for good. The first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle was the USS Pickering. In 1800, it departed from the US on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew. No one ever heard anything from them ever since. The popular explanation is that the ship was taken out by a storm. But because no one found any wreckage, we'll never know for sure. The largest ship that has ever disappeared in this mysterious area was the USS Cyclops. In March 1918, carrying a crew of 306 people, the USS Cyclops left Barbados and headed home to Baltimore. The ship passed through the Bermuda Triangle on its journey and vanished into thin air, or rather, water. The Cyclops never sent any distress signal and disappeared without any explanation or trace. The Bermuda Triangle isn't the only place in the world where ships go missing or mysteriously resurface. One of the most famous ghost ship stories would be of SS Bechimo. The large cargo steamer was built in Sweden. On October 1st, 1931, it got caught in pack ice. The crew decided to wait it out and managed to break free after a couple of days, only to get trapped again in less than a week. This time, they didn't manage to make it out. A rescue team went by air to save 22 of the crew members. 15 other members stayed in a wooden shelter they built not far away from the ship. Their plan was to wait out the winter and get back aboard. At the end of November, a strong blizzard was rushing through the area. 
When it was over, Beichimo seemed to have gone away with the storm. The captain decided it must have broken and sunk. But a few days later, a local hunter informed them that he had seen the ship around 45 miles away from their camp. The crew managed to find the ship and took the most valuable cargo from its hold. They had fears that Beichimo wouldn't live through that rough water, but it did manage to survive after all. Once the ice was gone, it floated away and ended up drifting along the shores of Canada and Alaska. Many people reported seeing the ghost ship in an open sea. Some even tried to board it to save the ship, but the weather didn't allow it to happen. The last time someone saw SS Bechimo was in 1969, 38 years after its crew had left it. It could still be drifting somewhere in the ocean. The story of MV Hoyita happened in the South Pacific. The ship was originally a wooden luxury yacht. After serving for 20 years to various owners, it became a merchant ship. In 1959, it set on a trading voyage that was supposed to last around two days. When it didn't reach its destination on time, no one was worried at first as things happen in the open waters. After another day and no distress signals from the Hoyita, it was obvious that something serious was going on with it. There were 25 people aboard and their families wanted to find them. A search and rescue crew worked for six days looking for the ship or at least its wreckage in an area of nearly 100,000 square miles. That's one and a half times as big as Florida. Sadly, the mission had come back with no results. It seemed like Hoyita had disappeared without a trace. A month later, another merchant ship noticed Hoyita driving in the ocean, miles and miles away from its original route, and none of the crew members or passengers were on board. The cargo had also disappeared. The lifeboats were also gone, so the people must have escaped the ship hoping to save themselves. It turned out that the crew had been trying to get help as they tuned the radio to the International Distress Channel. But the damaged cable didn't let them send the signal any further than two miles. It also looked like when they were leaving the ship, the crew took the logbook with them, and we still don't know what exactly happened to Hoyita. Family members of those who were on board are still looking for answers. One professor claims it must have been a corroded pipe that leaked and flooded the vessel. But we'll most likely never know for sure. In the Pacific Ocean, near Japan, there is an area nicknamed the Devil's Sea. It's believed to be one of the 12 vile vortices around the Earth. Some people claim that vile vortices have weird things going on in them because the pull of the planet's electromagnetic waves is stronger there than anywhere else. The most famous ship that disappeared in the area was a fishery patrol vessel in 1952. The ship went there to investigate the vessels that went missing previously and disappeared along with 31 crew members. Scientists who don't believe it was a mysterious disappearance blame the underwater volcano eruption for what happened. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast, and it's a mixed crowd from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant, to call it such a place, is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But, except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate, they use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. 
Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there's one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now that's a beach you can finally relax.